Tonight's episode, Murder by the Dead. The court will come to order. The court will come to order. The prisoner will stand. Peter Swift, you've been found guilty of willful and deliberate murder after a fair and impartial trial. Have you anything to say before a sentence is pronounced upon you? Yeah. I got something to say. Very well, be brief. Oh, I'll be brief, all right. You think you're going to kill me, but you ain't. I'll get you, yes, you, up on the bench there, and I'll get that district attorney, too. And just for good luck, I'll get the foreman of that crooked jury that railroaded me. Do you understand? Perfectly. Your threats against the district attorney and the foreman of the jury will, I am sure, go as unnoticed as your threat against myself. Peter Swift, I hereby sentence you to be taken from here to the place from whence you came and that there you be executed in the manner provided by the law. And may God have mercy on your soul. Uh, you will hang me, will you, you old fool? I'll get you, all three! And if I can't get you living, I'll get you dead! Take him away. <laughs> Cranston, it's good to have you back in America again. Oh, Margo, I cabled you that I was coming at once, just as soon as I got that frantic message from you. What's it all about? Lamont, the district attorney's star was murdered last week. Yes, I know. I saw it in the papers. I cabled you because I was afraid. Afraid? You? What's the matter? Spooks? Well, I I'm trying to believe it isn't. Oh, darling, you're talking nonsense. Oh, I only hope I am. Lamont... It was District Attorney Stowe who prosecuted that murder of Peter Swift six months ago. Yes, I remember the chap who threatened to come back and get Stowe and Judge Clive and the foreman of the jury. You haven't forgotten who the foreman of the jury was, have you? Oh, by George. It was your father, wasn't it, Margot? Your father is the third on the list to die. Yes, now do you understand? Oh, but my dearest girl, you surely don't intend to suggest that... Well, I, I mean... Peter Swift was hanged. All I know is that three men were threatened, and one of them is dead. A coincidence, of course. Well, perhaps. But I know you'll think I'm a fool, Lamont, but that, and, and I don't know how, but perhaps Peter Swift has come back. Peter Swift was executed. Hanging is usually effective. But there is something in what you say. I wonder now... Uh, so we're asked to believe that Peter Swift has come back from the land of shades to kill three men. Three were threatened. One is dead. Murdered. The killer must be then a ghost. A shade. Well, my dear, I suppose there's only one thing that can be opposed to a shade. And that is? A shadow. <laughs> my dear Margot... Oh, Will there be anything else, Judge Clyde? No, 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 that's all, Taylor. You might as well go to bed. I've got some work to do here in the library. May you keep me up for quite a while. Yes, sir. Good night, sir. Oh, poor Stowe. I wish I could forget him. What's that? What's that? Who opened that window? <laughs> you! Oh, yes. You see me, Judge? Peter Swift? But this... This is impossible. Oh, the dead has come back to keep my promise. You're mad. Or I am. Ghosts ain't never been had, Your Honor. Ghosts? But that can't no, be. Don't say it, Bill. Oh, you would, would you? Were <laughs> That's two of them. One more to go. <laughs> You 
got that Clive housekeeper outside? Yes, Commissioner. Well, I'll shoot her in. I'll get to the bottom of Judge Clive's murder. It's the last thing I ever do. Come in, Taylor. Commissioner Wilson wants to talk to you. Oh, yes, sir? This is Taylor? Yes, sir. I want to check your story. You told Sergeant Riley you left Judge Clive in his library about 11 o'clock? Yes, that's right, sir. Then what did you do? I locked the front door, and then I started to go up to bed. Go on. As I was passing the library door, I heard voices inside, so I listened. You see, I had let no one in, as I was, uh, I was surprised. Don't apologize. What did you hear? I heard a hushed voice, and then there were two shots, and the bell jangled. Now you tried the door, it was locked. So you ran around outside the house to the window, which you found open, right? That's right, sir. What kind of a voice was it you heard? Well, it, it was a kind of a hoarse, whispering voice. I, I couldn't make out what it said. I see. All right, Mrs. Taylor, that'll be all for the present. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, Commissioner Weston. Uh, yeah. You Our think dozen. the shadow murdered Judge Clive? I don't know. Commissioner Weston speaking. <laughs> you. So, you recognize my voice, Commissioner. I'm flattered. I wish I could get my hands on you. Get <laughs> you. On a shadow. Come, come, Commissioner. What do you want? As usual, just to be helpful. I can do without your help. I wonder. However, I've got a little suggestion for you. Have you ever thought of exhuming the body of Peter Swift? Ah, Peter Swift has been dead for six months. What do you want me to do? Get you a lock of his hair? Trace this conquer. Don't no bother. I'm walking from a booth at Union Station, and I'll be gone before you can get anyone here. No, Commissioner, I don't want a lot of Peter Swift's hair. Even if I did, I suspect you couldn't get it for me. I imagine he's still wearing it. Yeah, maybe. In his car. I wonder. <coughs> District Attorney Stowe and South Clive have been murdered. There's only Mr. Lane left. I don't believe in ghosts. No. But you believe in shadow, don't you? <laughs> Hello. Hello. He's hung up. What was that all about? Gardona, get an order for the exhumation of Peter Swift's body. <laughs> Finally, stand by for orders. The police are on the right track, but they may be too late. Go to the warden of state's prison. Pose as a newspaper reporter. Find out what disposition was made of Peter Swift's body following his execution. Hurry. Every second count. Sure. Sure planted him deep, didn't they, Commissioner? I don't want any cracks on it. Cardinal, haven't they gotten down to that coffin yet? How you coming, boys? Just hit the coffin, sir. We'll have it out soon now. Well, I'll snap into it and get the ropes on. I don't care much about this job, Cardinal. The digging of murderers in the middle of the night isn't my style. I'll have to take charge, sir. I know why. But this is more or less of a personal matter between myself and that fiend who calls himself the Shadow. Get on those ropes! All right, boys! Pull those ropes! All right, hold that rope short. We don't want it slipping back on us. No, pull! Here she comes, sir! All right, all right. Get busy with those screwdrivers and get the lid off. It's just nailed on, Commissioner. Then pry it off. <laughs> that does it. She's open, Commissioner. Well, let me look. Now we'll know. What's this? Looks to me like bricks. The coffin's filled with bricks. But, but, but where, where's the body? Where's Peter Swift? <laughs> Ask the shadow. Shadow, no. <laughs> 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 
longer waiting for the shadow, <laughs> I want to pass on a bit of advice of particular interest to all homeowners. If you're anxious to cut down your doctor's bills this winter, to keep your family free from a lot of sniffles and colds, then by all means, burn anthracite or hard coal. Because anthracite is the healthful fuel. It gives steady, even, helpful heat, in contrast to the flashy kind of heat you get from the on and off types of quick burning fuels. And friend, don't forget this point. Furnaces, cook stoves, and space heaters in this section of the country were especially designed to burn anthracite. And to get America's finest anthracite, ask for blue coal. Blue coal burns long and evenly, with the furnace dampers practically closed. There's no waste up the chimney. It gives economical as well as healthful heat. Blue coal is mined by the Glen Alden Coal Company, the world's largest producers of Pennsylvania anthracite. It is laboratory tested at the mines for purity and for uniformity of size. If you have never tried blue coal, place a trial order tomorrow. You'll find the name of your nearest blue coal dealer listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the name... Blue Coal. Oh, Lamont. Thank heavens you're back. Well, come in, Margo. Oh, Lamont, I was right about Peter Swift. I was right. Yes, I know you were. I found out from another source. My darling, you're trembling. What's the matter? Oh, I'm all right. I've just come from the prison now. I, I guess all that talk about bodies and executions has unnerved me a little. Oh, I'm terribly sorry I had to ask you to do it, but time is so short, and I had to be somewhere else. Oh, I understand. No, 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 calm down, and tell me just what happened from the beginning. Well, I, I went to see the warden, uh, said I was a newspaper reporter, as you told me to, and asked him what happened to the bodies of ex executed men. Yes? Well, he told me if the relatives don't claim the body, it's turned over to the state medical college. Yes. So I asked him about Peter Swift. Go on. The warden said that according to the record, Peter Swift's family called for his remains. However, he said as long as I was interested, he'd send for the guard at the South Gate. He, he'd know all about it. Pretty soon, the, the guard came up from the warden's office. Come in. Uh, you want to see me, warden? Come in, Sloan. This is Miss Lane. She's a newspaper reporter. Oh, pleased to meet you, miss. She wants to ask you about the removal of bodies. Oh, well, I can tell you about every stiff that's left here in the past 15 years. Uh, well, you see, I just wanted to ask... Well, the first one I ever saw was uh, Grimes. He was strung up for murdering his mother with an axe. <laughs> well, ma'am, when they, when they come for him, they... Just, just they, a minute, uh, Paul. Uh, There's one in particular Miss Lane is interested in. Swift. Oh, Peter Swift, huh? That's right. Remember him? Oh, certainly. His family was supposed to come for him, but they, they didn't come after all. No? No. Nah, a croaker named Craig came for the body in an old truck. A croaker? He means a doctor, Miss Lane. Oh. That's the rather unflattering prison term for a medico. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I reckon this croaker, Craig, had bought the body. Anyways, he took it away quick. He was in a great hurry, too. The, the stiff wasn't even cold yet. Uh, uh, do you know where this uh, Dr. Cragg came from? Sure, from the city. I got his address on the register down at the gate. You want it? Oh, yes, please. Uh, thank you very much, sir. A doctor named Cragg, eh, Margo? Do you have his address? Yes, here it is. Oh, thank you. Uh, now, listen, Margo, I've got to go out now. Lamont, I'm going with no, you. No, 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 you're not. You're, you're going home to be sure that your father doesn't leave the house until this thing is cleared up. But I don't think it'll be for long, but I don't want to take chances on his safety. But where are you going? Shadow is going to pay a visit to a certain Dr. Pride. <laughs> Solvent at last. I've got it. Doctor Craig. Huh? Who was that? Who spoke? Does it matter? I'm right here at your elbow. You lie. I'm the only person in the room. Oh, no, no, you're not, Doctor. But I wouldn't turn around to find out if I were you. Where are you? Where is that voice coming from? I can swear there's no one else here. Then you must be having hallucinations, mustn't you, Doctor? I'm sane. Same. I'm sure you are, but you can't see 
that's all. What do you want? Just a favor at a price. At a good price. How much? Twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> yes, a good price. Well, I've got a friend booked to hang on the 23rd of this month. <laughs> What's that got to do with me? Well, I can. Twenty grand. Uh, who's your friend? His name is Louis. Three-fingered Louis. Well, what am I supposed to do about it? Perhaps you could keep him alive. So, why come to me? Drop that gun, Doctor. I've got you covered. You dirty... You dirty. can't shoot the shadow. <laughs> Shadow. You don't mean it. Yes, I mean the shadow, Doctor. The shadow just wants a little information. You won't get it. A little information as to how you resuscitated Peter Swift. Brought him back from the dead, if you prefer the term. I won't tell you. And restored his broken neck. Ah, I did it. I did it. I've proved I can do it. But it's my secret. I don't care if you are a shadow or the shadow. You can't have my secret. No one can have it. It's mine. You don't have to trade your secret for mine. My secret of blinding eyes to the obvious. I can teach it to you in a few minutes. The shadow secret of invisibility. Well, I'm not interested in your secret, some psychological touch. What's the power of making oneself invisible compared to the secret of making the dead live? Perhaps you're right. Perhaps there is no comparison. But where did you learn that secret, Craig? Tibet or an African jungle? <laughs> I won't tell you. I won't tell you. It's mine. For how long will it be yours? For as long as I want it to be. Forever and for all eternity. Because only I know the secret, and I shall never reveal it. No. No. They called me a madman. They threatened to put me in an institution. You are a man, Crack. No, no, no. I am a genius. You were lucky. You benefited by an exceedingly rare coincidence. No, a no. coincidence that might happen one time in a billion, one time in a trillion. It was no coincidence, I tell you. It was my genius. And I shall hold my secret. I shall continue to make the dead live. You are making Peter Swift live as caused two other men to die. To die in the hands of Peter Swift. Ah, and what interest is that to me? I am not interested in that. I'm interested in the fact that the third man may die tonight. A man named Ross Lane. What do I care about Ross Lane alive or dead? It is nothing to me. Will you bring Ross Lane back to life? Oh, I, I could. I could. I can bring anyone back from the dead. I tell you, I have found the secret of life over death. I can prove it. Prove it again and again. I can prove it on myself. I can die and bring myself back to life. You are mad, Frank. Oh, am I? Am I oh, mad? Frank. Yeah, I'm only putting my gun on the table. Very well, then. I'm not afraid of you, even though I can't see you, you see? Yes, Frank. And I will prove to you what I just said. I am not mad. I am a genius. I have found the secret. Stop that. Ah. What was that? Why did you put that fountain pen in your mouth? Oh, so that's it. Potassium cyanide in that pen, huh? And you think you'll bring yourself back to life, huh? You were a fool. You were a madman. So now, as the shadow against the ghost, ghost of Peter Swift, but never the ghost of Dr. Cry. <laughs> <laughs> you, Jenkins? Good. I'll be right out. But, Mr. Lane, sir, Miss Margot left strict instructions that she were to not to go out of the house. Oh, she did. Well, when she comes back, you tell her I went out. Uh, I'm not going to be ordered around my, by my own daughter as if I were a child of three. Ridiculous. I can take care of myself. But, well, but, open the car, Jenkins. But, but Mr. Lane, the danger in my eye. I'm going straight to my own club. It's my own car with my own chauffeur. The club, Jenkins. Yes, sir. Jenkins! 
Jenkins, be careful. You turn that corner on two wheels. Remember, I have a weak heart. Drive carefully. Jenkins, did you hear me? Jenkins, what's the matter with you? Stop the car this instant. Jenkins, Jenkins. I, sh do, why, you're not Jenkins. Me. Uh, why, Ross why, Lane. why, you're, you're Peter Swift. Uh, I don't care who you are. Stop this car. Let me out. Uh, uh, let me out. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, Went and croaked by herself. Scared you to death, Will. Save me the trouble. I wouldn't be too sure of that, Peter Swift. What's that? Ross Lane is unharmed. He's only thinking he has a weak heart. Who? Who's that? Where are you? Don't tell me you didn't know. You had a shadow. There's a passenger, too, Peter. The shadow? Yes, the shadow. Well, what are you going to do? I think you'd better stop the car, Peter, and then I'll see that the front authorities get yeah. you again. And this time there will be no Dr. Kraft. Yeah. Well, this time they don't get me. No. Shadow or no shadow, I'm driving this car, and you don't dare touch me if you do. I'm and when they get you, Peter, they'll take you up on that little platform and blindfold you. No, no, and then no. they'll put the noose no. around your neck. No. The odd than the fight. No. Your driving is positively reckless, yes. Peter, I think. The emergency break is indicated. Did you see that crash? That's not the driver. That car's a total wreck. We have got three head on. Yes, you see that? Let me please let me in. I'm a doctor. How about it, Doc? The old man in the back is all right. He's just just fainted. Shot from it. And the other? Well, I'm afraid the short he is not for a broken neck. Broken neck. Hello. This is funny. What's that, Doc? The sofa has a metal brace on his neck now. He must have broken it once before. <laughs> Peter Swift, the only guy that ever died twice. Yeah, we're giving him a swell funeral, all right. I bet there's guys from every mob in town right in this room. It only look natural. <laughs> Waste of natural. And cast your lamps on the reed. Yeah. Peter liked flowers. They used to let him mow the grass and sing sing. Uh, who sent this little bunch of funny blue flowers? Huh? Oh, oh, that means uh, forget me nots. Well, ain't there no card? I guess there is at that. My gosh. Look here. Uh, what does it say? The shadow. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before today's thrilling episode in the life of the shadow comes to a close, we have an announcement that I'm sure will be of interest to everybody. Beginning today, Mr. John Barclay, our blue coal heating expert, will give a series of practical talks on the subject of automatic heating. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Barclay. Good evening, friends. Today, more than ever before, we realize the need for absolutely uniform heat in order to enjoy really healthful living conditions. <laughs> However, many people are under the impression that it is necessary to spend huge sums of money and install elaborate equipment in order to have this uniform heat. In other years, that was true. But, but uh, today, you can have uniform heat 24 hours a day for as little as $18.95. That's the price of a blue coal automatic heat regulator. Is this a simple device which can be installed on any kind of heating equipment? Oh, yes. It works equally well. Hot air, hot water, steam or vapor, heating plants, even on space heaters, which you probably know of as parlor stoves. 
Not only is the blue coal heat regulator so inexpensive that anyone can afford one, but its operation is simplicity itself. It consists of a thermostat located right upstairs where it's always handy, or you can have it in your living room, your dining room, your kitchen, anywhere at all. This thermostat is then installed to a silent, uh, connected to a, a silent motor located in the basement near the furnace. Is it easy to oh. install? Why, yes. <laughs> yes, the installation of the blue coal heat regulator is such a simple matter that it requires but an hour or two. In fact, you don't even have to let the fire in your furnace go out. And the charge for installation is very low, averaging around $5. Why not drop in to see your nearest blue coal dealer and let him tell you more about this remarkable new heat regulator. You'll find he's the outstanding heating authority in your community. And take advantage of his John Barkley trained serviceman who is qualified to give you expert counsel on any heating problem at no charge whatever. I thank you. have just heard is copyrighted by the Shadow Magazine. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs> Same time, the shadow returns. His latest adventure, same time, same station. Extra, extra, don't miss it, extra. Our cast tonight has included Dwight Weist, Margot Stevenson, Polly Bear, Jackson Beck, Arnold Moss, Sidney Sloan, Trudy Warner, Arthur Anderson, Dick Osgood, John Nanovic, organist Rosa Rio, and Terry and Ken Ross on sound effects. Is there another name I should mention? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Carl Weber as John Barclay. <laughs> this is your announcer, Ken Roberts, who joins with the cast in extending our appreciation to the creator of the shadow, Mr. Walter Gibson.